In the year 1980, Mount St. Helens in southwestern Washington looked like this. In the lakes and rivers lapping at its foot, heaven had created a masterpiece. This mountain challenged climbers and the imagination. The Indian people had great respect for the mountain's power. Some called it Luwit, the keeper of the fire. The lake that was the mountain's mirror became known as Spirit Lake. Eighty-three-year-old Harry Truman was one of the lodge owners at Spirit Lake. Unlike the others, Harry was a year-round resident. The legendary past was forgotten. The spirits of Spirit Lake ignored. Mount St. Helens glittered as a sportsman's getaway. Then, on March 20, 1980, seismographs at the earthquake watches of the Pacific Northwest got the jitters. A week later, after a 123-year sleep, the mountain woke up. Its clean, smooth peak swathed in snow was rent. Now gaped a soot-black crater 250 feet wide. The mountain's north began to crack, to slump. More steam, more spewing ash. Then a bulge, like a turgid boil, began swelling on the volcano's north flank. Every day, it was swollen five feet more. Gawkers, volcano watchers, descended from over the states and provinces of North America, from Germany and Switzerland, from as far as Israel. Mount St. Helens was news. Brave newsmen edged to the crater's rim. A sleeping beauty of a volcano was waking up. Scientists swarmed over it, making it the most studied volcano in North America. People were primed for fireworks. Some even climbed to the teetering edge of the action. They simply did not grasp the danger. Between April's end and May's beginning, the bulge had swelled to 320 feet in height, a half mile in width, and a whole mile in length. The governor designated a restricted zone five miles around the peak to keep back the volcano watchers. I've got a piece of the rock was the protest. 35 Spirit Lake property owners demanded access. But peace prevailed that Saturday. A law enforcement patrol escorted those frustrated property owners to Spirit Lake, where they could collect their belongings. The next day was Sunday, May 18th. To gather anything they'd left behind, the homeowners were to return to Spirit Lake at 10 in the morning. But at 8.32 a.m., the birds stopped singing. A quake collapses the bulging north flank. Gigantic blocks crash downward in the largest avalanche in recorded history. Pent-up pressure found release in a tremendous explosion, blasting out of the mountain at 220 miles an hour and reaching a velocity of miles per hour, 670. The explosion's fury was 27,000 times greater than that of the atom bomb that fell on Hiroshima in World War II. A pillar of ash shot 72,000 feet into the air and toppled onto Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. Hurricane winds felled 230 square miles of trees. For 19 miles, the blast seared. Spirit Lake was dammed, its banks denuded. Old Harry Truman, who refused to evacuate, lay buried under 300 feet of mud flow. Clogged rivers went wild.
hundreds of thousands of fish died, some in waters heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, I will lay waste to mountains and hills and dry up all the herbage. I will turn rivers into islands. People, animals, weltered in blizzards of ash and pumice. They came to call this day Ash Sunday. 540 million tons of ash poured down on the three-state area. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, as in the night. With the air veiled with soot, it was darkness at noon in Yakima, Washington. Sheltering forest that had taken years and years to grow was no more. And the death toll in wildlife was high. Elk, deer, bears, mountain goats, and mountain lions. Fifty-seven human beings perished. Search and rescue teams braved mud and possible eruptions in quest of survivors. This solitary figure is also part of a search team. His search and that of his colleagues is still going on. These are scientists. Mount St. Helens offers rare opportunities for study, and now, because of what has been learned, we are able to predict eruptions of this type the world over. Volcanoes cannot be controlled, cannot be programmed. We can only stand in awe and try to understand them. Today, this great laboratory of volcanism is one of the most dynamic of America's national parks and monuments. After the great eruption of 1980, this land seemed devoid of life, a volcanic desert. To the surprise of scientists, small critters, gophers, frogs, and plants survived, protected under the likes of snowbanks and clumps of snow. Polywogs appeared. Wind-blown seeds started to take root and sprouted foliage, lupin, Truly everlasting. Fireweed made comebacks. Lone shoots of the alder began growing again. New green offered a homeland for wildlife, and the birds of the air returned. The mountain is renewing itself. After having blown away its summit, a dome of oozing magma is growing in its crater. A peak may rise again. Volcanoes do not destroy the land, they transform it. Their thunderous blasts are fanfares, heralding new life. Once again, Mount St. Helens becomes a masterpiece of creation. <laughs>